are just not big enough. And it's just probably um, an evolutionary imperative that we use interventions. That's just enough to like take a zap some of the power, some of the force that you really need to be to meet the challenge. And if it's happening in the people surrounding you as a birther, that's just as bad. Police theory is just that, a theory. But so is the obstetrical dilemma. But it's all important to explore because of the consequences of seeing the pregnant body as somehow maladaptive or not able to begin labor without intervention. During the final weeks of pregnancy, conversations begin to swirl around induction. This is anything from a pessary to help the cervix soften, artificially breaking the waters, or a synthetic version of oxytocin through a drip. National maternity statistics for 2022 to 2023 showed that 33% of women in the UK had an induced labour, a number that is gently increasing, and it's up from 22% in 2012. Induction is all about minimising risk and possibly serious harm to the baby and sometimes the mother. It in itself exists for very good reasons, but it's not risk-free. There is evidence of a correlation between induction an assisted birth or a cesarean birth. We're going to explore more on induction in future episodes. It's a fascinating, important and thorny topic because just as there are concerns over the overuse of interventions, there are also concerns over some medical staff avoiding them with devastating consequences. But for now, let's explore the due date itself. How is it calculated in the first place? It's EDD, it's estimated due date, so it's not very precise. This is Asma Khalil talking about the 12 week scan. Asma is a professor of obstetrics and maternal fetal medicine and is also vice president at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She's a specialist in scanning women and babies with complications in pregnancy. So it's also worth saying that as the due date looms, there might be some other dates circling in your head too. Maybe you are pretty sure you know from your cervical fluid and temperature when you ovulated, and therefore the date that you conceived. Then there's also the date that's given to you in the first appointment with your midwife, calculated as 40 weeks from the first day of the last period, as well as the one from the dating scan. At <laughs> well, they will almost certainly all be different. It's confusing, even when it comes to the 12 weeks scan. Is it like the, what are the margins of error around due dates and these measurements? Yeah, so it's few days, um, plus or minus this due date. So it's not a very accurate, it's an estimate. I think for some people, the sort of the confusion around due dates or feeling like it's not quite right or not working with um, their body and their cycle, or maybe you know, worrying about the sort of margins of error in a scan can be quite crucial when it comes to a question like induction, can't it? Yes, and occasionally you do come across women who would say, but doctor, I, you know, this was, I was given this due date, but I don't think this is correct because I, I think actually I conceived and according to my dates, I should be only 39 weeks, not 40 weeks. Um, but again, I think it's, um, it's a time where you actually need to sit and explain how we calculate the due date, number one. So it could be plus or minus five days, for example. And in, in fact, um, particularly the first time, the first pregnancy, it's very common that women will go past their due date. And the national guidance is a nice guideline now with recommended induction if everything is fine, if there's no complications, no problems with the pregnancy, and the baby is growing fine. And, would recommend um, induction uh, by 41 weeks. But even that I think is maybe quite frustrating for people to hear because you could do induction at 41 weeks, but for some people, if the you know if it could be five days out, that could still almost be 40 weeks. You know, they could have lost a week of opportunity because of the margin of error in a dating scan. At the end of the day, I tell the woman, look, it's a, it's a way of being able to speak the same language. So when I communicate with your midwife, or with other healthcare professionals looking after you, that we are able to speak the same language and we have plans that sort of have one due date, even if it's not very precise and it's just an estimate. It's really worth 
worth remembering that only 4% of births actually happen on the date itself. And you might have heard that it varies around the world. So in some countries, your due date will be at 41 weeks, not 40. But often, that is to do with the way that it's calculated, rather than different views of gestation length. If you are being offered induction, you can always speak to a consultant, and they should lay out all of the benefits and the risks in your specific situation, so that you can decide. There are alternatives you can explore, such as ongoing fetal monitoring. But whatever is going on around the due date, chances are everyone is getting a little itchy and keen to get things started. But how? Well, no one actually knows what kicks off spontaneous labour. So I had my 14-week appointment at the birth centre, trying to do all the natural things to bring on labour. So we've had a curry for dinner. The mystery surrounding it has resulted in rumours and tales that have been passed down through the generations. I've been drinking raspberry tea, I've been eating dates, apparently pineapple juice is good. Or sex, long walks, sweeps, finishing clearing out the fridge. I'm sure a lot of this is old wives tales, but you know, can't harm, can it? What happens then when it all kind of begins to kick off? Well, if I knew, <laughs> I'd be a very wealthy lady. This is Leia Hazard. She's a midwife, author of Hard Pushed, a Midwife Story. And her latest book is called Womb, the inside story of where we all began. We don't actually really understand the mechanism that initiates labour, which is like mind-boggling that we don't know. Is it some kind of complex interplay between maybe some kind of chemical hormone that the fetus itself gives off? So maybe there are some things in the placenta that signal to the body, right, I'm, I'm done here, <laughs> over to you, so let's get this baby out. And sometimes it can be external factors like infection sometimes can initiate um, labour, especially preterm labour or other kinds of illness or trauma. So yeah, the short answer is we can guess at starts when it does, but we don't really know. But there's one factor I keep hearing about that I am very intrigued by. Can I just ask about the full moon, of which there is a fitting a picture of that right behind your head? Because I've heard stories that more people go into labour on full moons. I have read that that's not actually the case, but in my experience, as a midwife, if you're heading in for a night shift and see a full moon, you feel like turning the car around and going home. Really? <laughs> yeah. is, it that, is it that obvious? <laughs> um, it can be sometimes, but then again, it's sort of, is it just confirmation bias? Is it because you're expecting it to be busy, but you then notice that it's actually really busy? But you've seen full labour wards on full moons. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest, in this day and age, full labour ward almost every day, but I've definitely seen things pick up on the moons.
forget it. We're on uh, a, a, a fast track to hell. And um, they did say, I mean, I know it's, uh, um, it's an often used phrase, but a week is a short time in, it's a long time, rather, in politics. And well, it's just, day. It's, 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 day. yeah, day, that's right. And it just turned out around so completely, in, and it, from all the way over here, from 3,000 miles away, it does feel as though the, the, the temperature has changed and the, the window has been opened and we're breathing oxygen again. It doesn't matter 
it makes no difference whether he accepts it this time around because he doesn't have the weight of the White House behind him. He'll just be um, he'll just be whining on the outside. I am the most fabulous whiner. I, I, and I'm a whiner and I keep whining and whining. And he'll be a figure of fun. And people will be laughing at him, which is the thing he hates the most. Thanks for that. Uh, if you missed any part of this uh, super show, then I think you will find that it is oh, this letter is from the BBC World Service. If you're planning to stay up and fancy some comedy and drama through the night, then Radio 4 Extra is right up your street. So, until the next time we meet, this is Jim Lee at Broadcasting House, wishing you a safe and peaceful night.
A wildfire that's destroyed a third of the buildings in the tourist town of Jasper, and the Canadian Rockies is still burning out of control. Hundreds of firefighters are tackling the blaze. These nearby residents explained how the fire has affected them. Bay doors opening and closing, you can really smell the smoke here. I've seen a pretty big impact in town here. Uh, I'm asking if there's anything we can do. i got lots of friends in, in Jasper, and a lot of people are really taking advantage of the help right now because there's obviously a, a pretty dire need for it. We've got quite a few firefighters that are staying with us, and we are doing our best to give support for them and give them accommodation. World News from the BBC. Donald Trump is due to address supporters at a Christian conservative political conference in Florida amid signs that the race for the White House is tightening. He's appearing at what's called the Believer Summit in Palm Beach. The organizers of the event said it was clear that the former U.S. president had survived an assassination attempt earlier this month thanks to the grace of God. Earlier during a meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister in Florida, Mr. Trump warned of serious consequences for the Middle East if he's not elected president in November. After warmly greeting Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife to his Mar-a-Lago resort, the Republican candidate said the situation would work itself out very quickly under his leadership. Elizabeth Pitkill is a spokeswoman for the Republican National Committee. I'm told that they had a very, very good productive meeting with Donald Trump in office. Donald Trump was very committed to the alliance between Israel and the United States. He was very loyal to Israel within the embassy. Uh, he also obviously had the Abraham Accords, ending the Iran nuclear deal, like he said that he would, recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. So I think people can expect that to continue on the exact same way uh, when he's back in office. The U.S. Secretary of State has arrived in Laos at the start of a six-country tour of Asia aimed at reasserting American leadership in the region. Anthony Blinken will attend a foreign minister's meeting of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Myanmar and tensions in the South China Sea are high on the agenda. G20 finance ministers meeting in Rio de Janeiro have agreed in principle to try to make the global super rich pay their taxes, but the gathering stopped short of backing proposals by Brazil for a minimum tax on the wealthiest individuals. The thorny top topic of tackling tax dodging billionaires dominated the meeting. BBC News. matters I'm Roger Hearing. Coming up on the program today, a crazy week in US politics, but where does it leave the contest in November? Also, Venezuela prepares for an election with both the government and opposition claiming that they can rescue a disastrous economy. Argentina's strangely strong currency prompts Argentinians to spend their cash abroad. The pace of inflation is outpacing the current rate at which the government devalues the currency. So that means that the peso has actually become overvalued. In the South Pacific, Tonga lets satellite firm Starlink help people left without internet by an undersea earthquake. And actors strike in Hollywood again. This time, it's about voiceovers in video games. And I'll be joined throughout the program by two guests on opposite sides of the world. Andy Euler, energy journalism fellow at UT Austin and to Columbia University. He's joining us from Austin, Texas. Andy, a very good evening to you. Good to have you there. And across the other side of the world, Katja Smitrieva, who's an Asia Economics correspondent for Bloomberg, joining us online from Hong Kong. So Katja, welcome to your first program and a very good morning to you. Good morning from a very very wet Hong Kong this morning. I can sort of imagine. Like you've had a fair few uh, typhoons, I think, going on around there. But, but can you we all sort of begin the program getting a sense really of just very briefly what's going on in your neck of the woods? So, I mean, uh, what was sort of caught your eye really news-wise this morning? You know, this week has been really big in DC, as you mentioned, and I think uh, it's been the same on this side of the world as well. You know, we had the third plenum wrapping up in China, anything to help the economy so that was maybe a bit of a surprise. Yeah. Um, 
quickly talk about the aging population, low fertility rates, and there was some data out of Japan this week that uh, you know showed that it's actually much worse than we thought. Yeah, so those are the two things that are kind of on my mind. I was going to say, and that's a problem pretty much across the regions in Central in China, Korea, of course, uh, as well. Uh, thanks for that. I mean, Andy, let me I mean, catch up with you. As you probably can guess, we're going to talk about about U.S. politics fairly shortly. But anything else caught your eye this week? Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. I mean, we, we have a little bit of Olympic fever um, here in, in my household, specifically we've been watching the, the opening ceremonies. Um, elsewhere in the United States, honestly, the, the wildfire, it's been a lot of natural disaster talk and a lot of natural disaster news. Lots of wildfires on the West Coast in Oregon and California. Um, we actually had some wildfires here in Texas as well, and we have flooding. Uh, we're, I know we're going to talk about sort of internet connection. We had, you know, a hurricane in the Houston area that knocked out power for my cousins and uncle for four days in the Houston area. So that sort of reaction to natural disasters, you know, it turns out the time is changing. Well, indeed, and, and very much a picture of what's been uh, going on uh, in terms of, well, as you say, right across the East, really, in, in, in the uh, hemisphere. I'm in Canada as well, of course, the uh, extraordinary fires around Jasper. Right, well, let's talk about uh, things that aren't necessarily part of nature, but certainly seem to be part of our politics, or your politics anyway. And uh, because just a week ago, it seems strange to think, Joe Biden was still the Democrat candidate uh, to return to the White House next year. That failing badly, getting dithering and confused up against a Donald Trump riding a wave of support after surviving an attempted assassination. But now, his Vice President Kamala Harris is set to be the name on the ticket, and Joe Biden is going to see out his last few months as president. Harris has gained donations, millions of dollars worth already, and indeed endorsements from top Democrats, now including former President Obama. We call to say Michelle and I couldn't be prouder to endorse you and to do everything we can to get you through this election and into the Oval Office. Oh my goodness. Michelle Brock has been so much to me. There we are, Kamala Harris getting the backing of the former president. But it has been a wild week. Let's uh, talk to someone who's been covering it, uh, Paul Boger of NPR in Nevada. Uh, I mean, actually, Paul, you were on the, the program uh, a fortnight ago. Um, you know, they say a week's a long time in politics. Uh, a fortnight seems to have been an absolute decade, isn't it? Extraordinary, different era in American politics now. Absolutely. It has been uh, a very different conversation from two, two weeks ago. Whereas, you know, it, it kind of seemed like Republicans had, had very much sewn up some of the, the contests here in Nevada. They were polling very well. Joe Biden just kept slipping in the polls. Now, it is a very different story. There seems to be an enthusiasm, at least with the Nevada Democrats, that wasn't there before. Now, Nevada is interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's not normally considered a swing state, is it? Well, it, it is in the last several campaign cycles. Before that, really before 2008, 2004, Nevada was a Republican stronghold, you know. Uh, in, in the 80s, we had uh, Paul Laxalt as our senator, who was Ronald Reagan's best friend. Uh, it, Nevada was seen as an absolute deadlock for Republicans up until about 2004. Then 2008, we elected Obama, and it's been Democratic candidates winning the uh, election since then. Now, state-level politics, Republicans do much better. Um, they have won statewide office in the last couple elections. Our Republican is a popular Republican governor. So, uh, you know, Nevada is very much a swing state. I very much think it's back to a toss-up. Yeah, it's very interesting. And so what are you hearing then from uh, the people on either side of the aisle, I suppose, uh, in terms of their response to what's happened? I mean, first of all, you know, are, are the Democrats that you're talking to happy about the removal of Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris stepping in? I don't think happy is the word they're going to use. I think most have said that they are relieved. Um, we have to remember that during the 2020 primaries, we had a caucus and Joe Biden did not win here. As a matter of fact, Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders were pretty much the tied winners in that election. So Biden didn't win the state until the actual general election. So he's always kind of had a difficult time here. That being said, I think a lot of Democrats were willing to at least you know, go with the flow. They saw him as the incumbent. They think that he did a good job over the last several years. So they were happy to vote for him, but they, you know, they did voice concerns talking to them in February during the presidential preference primary. They were talking about concerns about his ability to be able to complete another term. So this isn't a new, cons new conversation. This wasn't something that just sprang up after the debate. These 
were serious reservations that voters had before that disastrous performance. Now, I think that when you talk to them, they are much more energized. Uh, there is a series of get out the vote and canvassing events scheduled throughout the weekend, and voters are absolutely, they're more galvanized than they were. Okay, well, well let me pause you for a minute there, because actually I'm gonna talk about the Republicans next. And in fact, in the last few moments, Donald Trump has begun speaking at, at an event uh, in Florida. Uh, he's talking uh, there, I think, to a group called Turning Point Action. Let's have a listen to what he's having to say. Jensen Franklin, one of the biggest, one of the most powerful, one of the greats. Thank you, Pastor. He's been with us from day one. Pastor well, we, can, we can hear there that uh, Donald Trump is beginning, in fact, by talking about various dignitaries there. Very interesting people on this. It, it's a religious group that he's talking to. And many people have expressed uh, surprise over the years, I mean, dating all the way back to when he first got into the White House, that someone who doesn't seem on the surface to be a particularly attractive figure to evangelicals, nonetheless is. I mean, is that a surprising thing? Well, you know, it's it's hard to answer that. Yeah, before the uh, before we lived in Nevada, I lived in Mississippi covering politics there and during the 2016 campaign as well. And I do think in 2016 that a number of Republican voters in the Deep South saw him as a flawed candidate, but the one that was sane and really at least paying attention to what they were wanting to, wanting to hear. And he's proven popular with that demographic. You've seen him have success with the Supreme Court. You've seen him have success with federal judges up and down the bench. So I think that it, they're looking forward to another term. Uh, that being said, you know, Nevada, of course, is a toss up, uh, but Republicans probably still have an edge here. And I say that because economically, Nevada is still really struggling to bounce back after the pandemic. They're still high, it has the highest unemployment rate in the country, some of the highest child care costs in the country, uh, some of the slowest wage growth, highest cost for groceries. So people are really looking at their pocket book and thinking, you know, sure, I might be a um, very moderate Democrat, but I sure was doing better four years ago under Donald Trump before the pandemic. So it's, it's very much one of those things where I couldn't tell you where those non-partisan voters are going to go. Well, it's very, very interesting. Paul, thank you so much. I, I'm sure we'll try and come back to you uh, in the run-up to November. It's really interesting to see what's happening in, in a place like Nevada and reaction to everything that's happened. So, Paul, thanks for being with us. Let's, uh, let's talk to my guest on this. So, Katya, let me bring you in. I mean, obviously, you're a long way away from this. You're in, in Hong Kong, but you're observing it. I, I, what you said earlier, you're clearly taking out the keen interest. What are your thoughts about how the context has changed now that Kamala Harris is on the team? Well, you know, everything has changed just in the span of about a week and a half. Um, up until about six months ago, I was in D.C. and I was covering economic policy, first under Trump and then under Biden. So the thing that I'm going to be really interested to see is how Harris kind of messages on something Andy just talked about, which is pocketbook issues, um, because Nevada might be feeling it quite hard because it's you know highly dependent on the service sector, uh, hotels, resorts, um, but you know, across the country, inflation in the states is, is the number one issue. I mean, um, that might have changed in the past one or two months, but it still remains the case. So I'm really curious to see how she'll message on that because I think the takeaway from Biden's messaging was that it just wasn't hitting home, um, you know, saying that, hey, we've actually done a lot for you. And um, I saw one article that uh, called it gaslighting of voters. So things like that. So I'm really curious messages on that, but go ahead, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Katja, you're picking out the economic issues in this, and, and, and as you say, Paul certainly pointed to those when he was talking about Nevada, but, but but is it also, I mean, one of the big things that seemed to go through that Joe Biden was just the fact that he wasn't uh, perhaps up to the job in the sense he, he seemed confused, he seemed forgetful, you know, but he's not that perhaps more important, do you think, than, than, than the money side of it? Yeah, that was that. So in poll, this is a really good point. So in the polls, uh, including our own that we took sort of in the past year or so, you could see the issue of age slowly creeping up. So about a year ago, you would be writing about it or um, talking to his PR people about it, like the White House folks. 
about it. And it's sort of like, oh yeah, he's, he's doing okay. But it really became an issue, I think as you highlighted earlier, just during the debate, it was just very obvious and couldn't really be messaged anymore. Um, I think Harris would have been surprised with, I mean, obviously she's much younger, he's a woman of color, she would be, um, you know, the first black female president, which would be, which would be huge. I think I've been surprised just by how big her support was. You know, if you look at polls just in the past week, you actually see her narrowing the gap. Yeah, the latest, that. the latest one, in fact, we had uh, just about an hour or so ago, certainly suggests it's very, very close within the margin of error. Andy, let me bring you in on this. How, how does all this look from Texas? First of all, what do you think about the, the Kamala Harris effect? Yeah, no, it's really interesting, and, and, and Kelsey is exactly right. It's sort of pocketbook issues, but at the same time, I think from a voter's perspective, especially from an independent voter's perspective, I think you kind of know what you're going to get from a new candidate being Harris, but being sort of in that same ticket, literally on that same ticket. So you know sort of what the economic policy is going to be. It's probably going to be pretty pro-labor. It's probably going to you know, embrace unions, things like that. You're going to have Silicon Valley and people like Elon Musk and others sort of leaning toward the Trump administration because they don't want to pay higher taxes, things like that. So I think, honestly, you know, she's trying to bridge um, businesses and sort of big high profile CEOs into understanding where she's coming from. But I think they probably do because I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of diversion from exactly what was happening in the Biden administration. Honestly, I think it's going to be, yeah, and that could come back to, to bite this new campaign where it's going to be, look, inflation's not great. We haven't had a whole lot of um, relief from uh, pocketbook issues, from going to the store, from going to the gas station and filling up our cars. What are you going to do to make things better? If you're on the same platform, it, it might actually be kind of tough. Even though people are going to understand where she's coming from, she might have to sell something different, honestly. Yeah, no, I mean, if we're thinking it might be more about uh, issues like finance, let mm -hmm. me just quote what uh, Donald Trump said in the speech that we heard at the beginning of just now. He said uh, she, talking about Kamala Harris, was a bum three weeks ago. Um, I, I, I think the insults are going to keep going, aren't they? Anyway, let's uh, let's move our focus on to another place that has an election coming up, and that is Venezuela, and that's very imminent. In fact, it's happening on Sunday. After more than a decade of political and economic turmoil, uh, there are great concerns about the fairness and transparency of the vote. In fact, Panama reported earlier that uh, Venezuela banned access to a plane carrying former presidents who are going to try and serve as observers. President Nicolas Maduro has also caused alarm by saying he will win, and I quote, by hook or by crook. No denying that the Venezuelan economy is in a desperate plight, despite having the world's largest proven oil reserves. Millions of Venezuelans have actually left that country to escape economic hardship. But the incumbent president, Maduro, has promised things will turn around. Sunday will set the future of Venezuela for the next 50 years. Peace or war. With next Sunday's victory, we will guarantee the way to peace in Venezuela for the next 50 years. For peace, for stability, for development and growth. Nicolas Maduro talking to a rally. His main opponent, opposition leader Edmundo González Urrutia, also speaking at a rally, said the government had failed to benefit the people despite its promises. They've been promising and lying for 25 years. They've been promising and destroying for 25 years. You'll see how we will achieve the change that will make our economy develop and allow each one of you to live better. It's time for Venezuela to find reconciliation among Venezuelans. Enough of shouting, enough of insults. It's time for the reunion. And with the word of God, we will see each other on Sunday and celebrate the triumph of Venezuela. Well, what are the challenges then for the country? The Financial Times Latin American editor, Michael Scott, told me about the state of the economy. Well, it's slightly better than it was, which isn't saying much. So this is a country whose GDP collapsed by three quarters in the period up to 2019. And there's been a modest recovery since then, which has benefited a handful of people. It's still an economy that's on its uppers. It's still a country that's in a pretty desperate state, but it's improved a touch in the last five years. 
But this is a country, Michael, that, that has, I think, I'm right in saying, the largest proven reserves of oil in the world. I mean, why is it in this mess? Well, enormous mismanagement. recovery it's just started to come back from the brink a little bit but it's very fragile and very delicate so business people here are hoping that the results on sunday will help to improve that process and take it forward rather than set it back once again by which they mean uh, they hope for the victory of the opposition leader Edmundo urutia i presume not necessarily so there are some folk here who found a sort of accommodation there's a slightly unusual accommodation being reached between some of the private sector here and the government to sort of pass this understanding they both need each other. So there are some people in the business world I've talked to who would actually prefer to see Maduro carry on because they have the argument 